Hello, my name's Martin and welcome to, uh, to Strat Chat. So this is the first of, I hope, quite a few guides into very, very specific things in, um, in Crusader Kings 3, specifically this time it's raiding. Uh, I think I'm going to be looking at a lot of things that you, you may or may not know, but I've also got a couple of things which I think are not so well known. I've asked questions on forums about these things and people don't seem to be aware of how they work. Um, so, so, you know, you know, watch this through. I um, hope you enjoy the whole thing. Um, there are time stamps, so if you want to zoom to certain aspects, then of course feel free to go ahead and do and do that. So raiding. The first thing to point out is is or to talk about really is who can raid, and this is very very straightforward. If you are a feudal or a clan type government, you generally speaking can't raid. If you are tribal, you can. That's the big thing. So in the tribal, um, I mean, you can look at government types. So this is in te uh, this is in eight, the eight six seven start. You can see this is huge area here of tribal governments. All of these can raid a uh, little bit um, over here, and of course in Africa, and those people can um, can raid. There are some cultural um, tenets, which are, tenets might not be the right word here, kind of cultural features which allow people to to raid, which I'll come to later on. So there are some limited number of feudal clan governments that might be able to raid. You might be able to design your culture so that you can raid even after you become feudal or clan. But we'll have a look at that a little bit later on. So, so what is raiding? So basically, raiding is a way of waging war, um, raising your armies. In fact, I'll do it over here. I'll, I'll, I'll get my armies here to, to, to raise all as raiders. I'm going to raise those as well. So I've raised all of my armies here in Home Garden. If I just click on them, you can see, yes. So these these I raised as raiders. These I didn't, so I can make those into raiders. These ones, yeah, they're all as raiders. So you can see we've raised in two separate uh, two separate locations. We've got an army here under me, another army here under my uh, under my son, and both of these are raiders. That means that they can move into territory that doesn't belong to us. I'll do it here. Um, and this one we will send over here. Let this play out. And you can see we're beginning to raid here. We can see that this table is slowly filling up over, you can find out 21 days left there. When that gets to the end, we're gonna get that loot here, 15, 15 loot. And our army, has a loot carrying capacity of 126. So when we get there, we'll have 15 of 126. Okay, so we had another result there as well. So we also took somebody in the siege. So as we took it, captured somebody. Um, captured the chieftain. Okay, so he might be quite a valuable character to ransom, for example. So, uh, in fact, yeah, he'll give me 22 to release him. It's often worth on raiding just releasing kind of noble people that you happen to happen to find along the way. And then what you want to do is look for another target. So we got uh, our father here. No, it's our son, isn't it? Over here is is, is begun raiding this place. Um, we can go over to to there and we can raid. There are some rules about who you can raid. So, for example, you cannot raid somebody with whom you have a truce. Now, we don't have a truce with anybody at the moment, but truces uh, are here in the kind of diplomacy section. They normally come from you having attacked somebody and perhaps taken a county off them. And as a part of the kind of peace treaty, you have a treaty for a truce for five years. If you've got a truce, you can't raid. A number of times I've raised my forces, sent them off somewhere. Go, why can't they? Well, they don't seem to be doing anything. That often is the reason. Obviously, you can't raid people with whom you have an alliance, nor can you raid the realms of your own liege. Now, Rurik here is, uh, is, is, is the top of his own realm. He doesn't have a liege. But if we did, we wouldn't be able to attack fellow vassals. It's also no point in going to counties that have a bigger garrison than you. I'm going to give you a really, really good example of this. Now, as Rurik... I took all my raiders down through down through the rivers into the Black Sea to raid Byzantium. I thought I was being very clever. Byzantium has a garrison of 3,500 at the moment. 
which means that in order to raid it, you need to have 3,500 at least in your army. Now, what happened when I went down there is I, I was raiding very successfully. It was going down. It goes down quite slowly because the a fort level is so high here. But it was going down. And I was going to get this 105 loot. And attrition caused my army to drop below 3,500 or whatever the garrison was at the time. And at first, I didn't understand what had happened. It was only afterwards that I, I thought back and realised what had happened. You, you need to, to also consider uh, consider that when you're thinking about your targets. Is your army actually big enough uh, to raid these um, raid these places? But you can see how I can use these guys to kind of like staying fairly close together is is the basic idea. Because if somebody comes out to fight us, we don't want to be um, too isolated. But at the same time, it's much more efficient to have them working um, kind of in, collabor in collaboration as two, two or three units moving around uh, because it takes time to siege these places. So you might as well have them sieging more than one place if, um, if you can. So I think you should plan raids carefully. OK, so the first is check for loot. So if I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about raiding up here, I'm going to have a little look. Yep, they got some loot. This is very right at the beginning of a game, so nobody's been around raiding yet. But uh, you know, these these two only have only have three. So I might be thinking, you know, I, I quite fancy going uh, up to um, Kakis Salmi, but is it really worth my time going and and, and raiding these places? Um, so perhaps you know, think about: Are there lots of places together? So we've got a fifteen there. I've only got a three there. So this looks like a relatively poor area. Might still be worth raiding it, but you need to 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 kind of like evaluate that because there are some costs to raiding too, which we'll come to. Check it's a valid target. We've already talked about that. Check the power of your target. So uh, this is quite a good example, really. Uh, really. So Salinis is controlled by this guy here. Uh, his army is one thousand eight hundred seventy-nine. If I send my guys there, and I just send one of these groups, tell you what. I'm going to send these guys there. I suspect that he'll come out to fight. And he'll come out to fight because he's, I d I'm not massively stronger than him. So I think there's a good chance that we'll, we'll see a battle emerging once I start to raid in here. The good thing is they don't bring allies in for raids. So that's a good way of attacking somebody who's too strong for you because of their alliances. Right, let's just have a look, see if anybody comes... No, he's decided. To, he's, he's decided that it looks a bit too dodgy. Uh, let's ransom this lady. Why not? Um, plan your groups as well. So I've sent this. I pretty haphazardly off in as two groups. I didn't really think about it, but it's. In, but it's. It makes sense to plan your groups. So maybe get your forces together. Now, while I'm at home, when you're a raider. Um, you can split off new armies. So I can I can say, right, OK, I'm going to split these levies roughly into two groups. I'm going to have some of my strong guys with them, some of my strong guys with those. I can, like, um, set up the, two, the two, kind of two or three kind of groups that I want to be controlling. Raiders can't do that in enemy territory. They can do it in, in ordinary armies can. But raiding armies can't split up once they're in enemy territories. So that's kind of a little bit of, um, I don't know, tactical inflexibility that you get that you need to think about. So, so you, that's why you need to kind of like plan raids, OK? So if I was going to raid all around here, I'd probably raise all of my armies in the same place here and then split them up into two or three constituent armies and send them off in their, in their various ways. Right. So... Notice now, I've just got this. Your raiders bring back 33, so we, you don't actually take possession into your treasury of the 33 loot gold until you actually get back to your territory. And then it kind of, it's, so, so if you get attacked on your way back and you get defeated in a battle, you lose all of it. You also get an equivalent amount of prestige as well. Always worth looking for, um, if, if you're playing a, a civilization that has African war canoes, Viking longships, or and there is another there is another trait I can't remember what it's called now. See if I can find it. Um, seafarers, um, which is a trait that and you know you can acquire for your culture through, uh, you know through the normal kind of like uh, cult, you know adapting your culture kind of like uh, methods. 
uh, those allow you to go down rivers and that's really really powerful so it's why when I played Rurik I was able to use these river systems to take my raiders right the way down to the Black Sea with very rich pickings around the Black Sea and with the you know the exception of the Byzantine Empire they're not massively powerful you know you can with Rurik you can attack Bulgaria um, and you'll be fine so uh, look out for those. So those. Are, so, so I think it's important to kind of like plan and think through your raids. Okay. Juiciest targets are realm capitals, and then we can see realm capitals here. We have got uh, Kargopol. This is the realm capital. So that's that's the juiciest target. It might be actually I tell you, Ireland's a very good place to demonstrate this because it has the temple holdings. So Desmond is worth 15, but if you zoom in, you'll notice that there are churches, temple holdings, and uh, these are worth much less, sort of like five, six is quite typical for, for church holdings in Ireland at this kind of time. But the county, the tribal holds are, like, are, are always like sort of like 15. If you go to a part of the world which is much, much more highly developed, so down here, for example, um, you're going to find um, more valuable temples. You're also going to find cities that are very, very valuable. So this city is is 19. Um, the, temp the, the actual um, county capital was, is, um, is is 28. So this is much more highly developed areas. Of course, if you're raiding more highly developed areas, you want to make sure that they're not also very, very well um, defended. Yes, yeah, so look for developed cities and temples, realm capitals, more developed land. So what do you get? So you get the loot. Um, normally it takes you a few weeks to, to complete it, depending on the defences of the, of the place that you're raiding. You'll get the loot. You will also, when you get home, you will also get prestige equal to the gold that you've looted. There's a good chance of you taking hostages and those can be sold back or potentially recruited and or, or executed or whatever it is that you want to do with them okay so that's sort of the basic kind of like mechanics but the next thing i want to tell you about is really the icing on the cake and basically as a raiding army if i win any battles i'm going to i'm going to be getting prestige instead of fame for those for those victories Okay, somewhat incidental, but not everybody knows it, is that if you are being raided and you are able to raise your troops, uh, I, I might just move it this side of the river, and you're very confident of a victory, uh, raise all men at arms, and let's raise my host as well, and put them together. If you defeat raiders raiding your territory, you win prestige for that victory, instead of fame and that could be very very valuable to you let's just have a look and see what happens here okay we're going to win no trouble excellent easy victory and we had 110 prestige from that we only lost 31 troops they're soon going to be recovered um, and if they've been raiding successfully in other places we would also have taken the gold from them at the end okay so i've got my um men at arms up to quite good um, quite good strength now okay so what i'm going to do is, is we're going to go raiding and this time we're going to be trying to bait the enemy into battles that they're going to lose because when you are a raiding army you also win prestige instead of fame for winning a battle when you're a raiding army so you get that when you're attacking raiding armies but you also get that when you are a raiding army yourself and you win a battle not when you're in a normal army. As a normal army, you win fame, which is also valuable, but not in such an immediate way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise all my men at arms here, and I'm going to raise my host, but it's the host that I'm going to send off to fight, or off to raid. Uh, actually, you have to remember to make them into raiding armies before they leave your territory. That's a simple simple mistake to make okay let's send them. what i'm really hoping is that this guy raises his army he's not going to raise his army is he so what we have here really is an example of a kind of economy of force in a sense so i've not raised my levies 
because when I raise them, it's kind of quite expensive um, because they'll stop working in the fields, etc., and your income will go down. And if those levies are away, for example, for 12 months or so, and it's costing sort of two gold per turn to have them raised and you know you're coming back with 50 you know you can see you're not really making that much money it's far far better because prestige is so easy to come by it's far better to send off your men at arms to do the raiding um and leave your levies working in the fields especially if they're not particularly effective soldiers right we've, we've got a reaction here so we've got an army that we can potentially fight right See if we can get those guys in there. We can also uh, raise all here. Notice our income goes down very dramatically, halves basically. We're going to win this battle here. We recovered lots of loot from them and we have a nice big chunk of prestige. So the real value of raiding, obviously the gold is useful. Obviously, there are opportunities to double it sometimes as like a random event, uh, which, which is obviously useful. Getting the prestige, when you get the gold back, you get the equivalent amount of prestige. Obviously, that's valuable. But very, very often, and like when I was playing Rurik, very, very often, the only reason I was raiding was to try and cause these wars. And you notice in that one how, I mean, it wasn't the best example, but sometimes you can kind of bait a, 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 the people you're raiding into raising their army to fight with a relatively small raider. But it's near your border and you can raise the rest of your guys really quickly and win a big battle. The prestige win from those battles is very, very super effective. That's the icing on the cake, I think, with, uh, with raiding. Especially with a few traits, which I'll, uh, which I'll come to and mention in a moment. So just think about things you can do to improve your raiders. Obviously, a strong army is, is very, very valuable. If you can get the Reaver um, perk, or the Reaver ability, uh, Reavers have 75% attrition reduction. Attrition is the real problem for raiders because you're going into foreign territory and the guys start dying straight away. 75% reduction in attrition is very, very valuable indeed. It means that not only is your army getting smaller much more slowly, so you can stay on campaign longer, but it also means that when you come back, because you've lost less men, it's less time to kind of rebuild your army. Now that Reaver trait also doubles raid speed. So altogether, that's a very, very valuable trait. And I believe you can get it by leading. If your leader leads, I don't know, a certain number of raids, I think you can win the, um, the Reaver trait. Or of course, you might get it randomly. Um, <coughs> um, The North Germanic legacies give you faster naval speed, which is which is useful because you can start sort of raiding across the sea. Um, also, a hundred percent prestige and um, and fame, which is obviously very useful, um, and also gives you the Winter Soldier trait. And among the things that the Winter Soldier trait gets is that you're much more likely to have Winter Warriors, and these are soldiers that are able to fight more effectively in winter conditions. That's very, very useful for raiders. Um, otherwise, they suffer from a great deal of attrition um, when they're away for a long time raiding. It's very difficult to kind of like go a long way within the summer, complete your raiding and come back. So, you know, most often, you know, you want to stay out for longer. The Winter Warrior trait makes that much more effective. It also means that your armies will be fighting more effectively against other cultures. Um, a couple of cultural things that might help you. Um, you've got uh, battlefield looters. It's a cultural trait. You can always um, sort of, uh, you know, pimp your culture and, um, and, and gain battlefield um, looters. This gives you more money, more gold, and less prestige, that's the effect of that one. And that might be useful later in the game, perhaps if you are not feudal, but still have the option to, to loot. And we'll talk about why that might be, that you might have that uh, in a minute. Winter Warriors, obviously a very good trait. Practiced Pirates is another cultural trait. And Practiced Pirates means that you can still raid even if you are feudal or if you are clan. It has the effect of reducing the amount of prestige that you get, but increasing the amount of money that you get. That, with battlefield uh, looters, um, 
could be a very, very effective way to go because prestige becomes less valuable to feudal and clan leaders. Um, gold becomes more important. The seafarer cultural trait is useful. Seafarer allows you to go down um, rivers. And going down rivers just makes a massive, massive difference. You know, when I played Rurik recently, I was able to use, um, I can't even see them here, but there's rivers going all the way down down here to the Black Sea, which is a really, really good place to, to raid. Very, very rich, but some of these places are not overly strong. We'll be a little bit careful with the Byzantine Empire, Empire and the and Khazarians. But you can raid very quickly because the, the places are on the shore. Um, you know, you've got 11 loot there, you've got 14 there. If you go up this river, uh, I seem to remember there being some very um, rich pickings along this river, which of course I'm not going to be able to find now that I'm, uh, I'm talking to you guys. Okay, so, um, and of course you've got the cultural specific ones. Uh, you've got long boats for the Vikings, which allows... Um, which is, makes seafaring better, but also allows access to rivers. And I think there's like an African war canoe trait as well. All of those have kind of like sort of similar effects. So as you can see, I think, I hope, raiding is super overpowered in the game. But you do need to plan it. You do need to think carefully. You do need to or organise and structure your armies before they go out. Um, but, but once you are raiding in somebody else's territories, you can no longer split your forces. So you need to kind of like plan that before you go out, plan them in, into, into little groups. Um, try to bait the enemy into battles they're going to lose dramatically. Um, all of those things are super useful. I just want to show you one last thing, and that is the Dynasty Legacy Tree. Legacies. So... If you are of North Germanic, um, if you're North Germanic culture, you have these additional two um, legacy trees up at the top. This is the one we're interested in for raiding pillage, because sea walls that actually doubles the amount of fame and prestige that you get from battles. Those battles that were just fighting against against raiders suddenly become incredibly, incredibly um, rich pickings in terms of like gaining lots and lots of prestige and you know increased naval speed things like that are obviously useful and all the way up here you find um, capabilities which are going to help you in raiding this one increases your loot capacity um, it also allows you to increase the size of your heavy infantry regiments uh, this one increases the amount of gold you get from ransoms um, and you gain prestige when you're ransoming prisoners um, you're also more likely to get imprisoned characters after successful raids and sieges. So you can see this legacy tree, if you are a practised pirate, if your job is going to be to make a lot of your wealth from raiding, it's going to be very, very successful. As a tribal leader, you know, troops cost prestige. If you can get bucketfuls of prestige from raiding, then you can build your army very, very quickly. But just recently I played against... Um, I played as a Rory kid and I built the... I formed the Empire of, um, of Russia... Um, not actually as Ruri, he died, but his uh, great grandson Helgi was the emperor of um, of, of, of Russia. Was carrying on raiding, was still tribal, was carrying on raiding, and was taking oh, and was coming back with so much prestige that we were able to be able to like sort of build up these buildings um, very very uh, quickly as we're working towards becoming um, becoming feudal. Now I've made some notes, and those notes are going to be put onto my uh, onto my Patreon. Um, if you uh, decide to join my Patreon, I'd be very very grateful if you did. It's only a pound on the, the lowest tier. You'd be able to download those notes. It's not like an essay or anything like that. It does kind of like just sort of list of bullet points of things that I've talked about today. Um, I've even known people to go onto Patreon, uh, sign up for it, download what they want, and then um, and then cancel it before they've even paid anything. I'm not even that bothered if you do that, um, but. They are there. You can have a look at them, uh, perhaps download them, and maybe you know a useful reminder as you're kind of like fine tuning your uh, raiding skills. Thank you very much. Uh, hope that you got something out of it. Please put some comments at the bottom if you did. Say something. Uh, make some comments. Say something that I got wrong. You know, suggest something different about the, the style of my delivery or whatever, or anything like that. I'm very very happy to hear about. Obviously happy to, happy to hear if you you liked it and thought it was really good as well. Um, and um, consider please liking and subscribing. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.